Cliff Richard leads a kind of life that most of us can only dream about. Staggeringly rich, incredibly famous, homes all over the world, and with possibly the most devoted army of fans ever seen in the history of pop music. Let me tell you people, let's call rock and roll. Outstripping Madonna, Elvis Presley, and even the Beatles, Cliff has sold more singles in the UK than any other artist. But despite all that, Sir Cliff Richard remains an extraordinary enigma. What really makes him tick? And in this his 50th year in show business, how come he's still around when so many others have just faded away? To find out, I'll be getting up close and personal with Cliff at his multi-million pound home in Barbados. This is real skin, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure real is. nose. And finding out what life was like at his childhood home in England. Tell me about the day your father died. He died on us, you know, and, and everything was just beginning to happen for me. This is Cliff Richard as you've never seen him before. Do you feel uncomfortable talking about sex? No. As I discover the truth about the man behind the pop star. How many shocking things about Cliff Richard do you know that we don't? months of the year, while the rest of us freeze, Cliff Richard lives here, in the Caribbean splendour of Barbados, enjoying a very comfortable 32 degrees. Twenty-five years ago, when I was a lean, mean rookie reporter for a local newspaper, it was one of my first assignments to meet and interview Cliff Richard. So I'm keen to see how superstardom has affected him since then. Hi there, uh, Piers Morgan to see Sir Cliff Richard. You know where he is? No. So it's for a TV show, we're just having a bit of, you know. Yeah, but. So I say. I gotta phone him to find out if he's expecting you. Right. All right. Why don't you do that? All right. Cliff's house, I would describe as Hollywood in Barbados. It's a gated property, so you have to. They have to expect you, otherwise, you don't get in. Yeah, you can go through. Everything. Cliff may have come from humble beginnings, moving from India to England in the 40s. But now, as one of the richest men in pop, apart from Barbados, he also has homes in England, New York, and a vineyard in Portugal. So this is the gateway to Sir Cliff Richard's Barbados hideaway. It's so private that no cameras have ever been allowed through those gates. So actually, it's quite exciting. Hello, can I help you? Oh, hi there. It's Piers Morgan here to see Sir Cliff Richard. Come on in. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Not for that. Now, I've been told that Piers is always on time. <laughs> so, Cliff. Hey. <laughs> in your castle. I know. Welcome well, to... Look at this is absolutely amazing. Isn't it fantastic? I just it's, caught it from the car. It's my own personal little piece of paradise. Lovely to see you. Welcome. Thank nice you for inviting me into in. your amazing home. Oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, that must be one of the best views I've ever seen. Well, I mean, I would say this, but I think it is the best view. <laughs> It's absolutely outrageous. <laughs> it is fantastic. Cliff bought this plot of land eight years ago and, complete with infinity pool and tennis court, built this amazing six-bedroom hilltop retreat. You built the whole thing? Yeah, I mean, I, not personally. Not personally. <laughs> no, but I did. I came over for four days and stayed in a hotel up here called Cobbler's Cove. Yeah. And each day the architect came and I can't draw, but I can draw blocks and I said I'd like it to look like this and I've got this section facing slightly south that section facing slightly north what was your what was your dream for it really the main thing was to actually have the view of the sea what do I call you are you Sir Cliff I mean how do you play it oh, no, no I mean Sir Cliff is fine but if you're going to talk to me you just have to bow occasionally <laughs> <laughs> that is fine and do you like it you like being Sir Cliff I do actually even now 
it's quite a nice, nice little appendage to have, isn't it? The serpent. It's, it's, I, I like it. I tend to live outside, so whoever comes to visit, we always tend to end up sitting outside day and night. In the evening, this place changes drastically and looks quite different. You know, once you've got candlelight going and low-key lighting, it looks absolutely I mean, wonderful. I mean, it really is absolutely idyllic here. This table, I reckon, has seen lots of celebrity action. <laughs> so come on, let's have a few names. Well, who, about, who have you had around this I table? I don't know about celebrity action, but certainly a lot of action, certainly from the... Scylla Black's been here. Scylla? Yeah, Scylla. Scylla sat there. Uh, it was, who else, her, who it was her birthday last here? year. Um, I'm trying to think who else celebrity was. Michael Flatley has been in the house, but I don't know whether he dined with me. Actually, the two people that we've forgotten about, of course, the most famous people at this table would be Tony and Cherie Blair. Oh, they'd have eaten here, but of course I never ate with them. No. In August 2003, just four months into the Iraq War, the then Prime Minister, his wife and family, accepted an offer to stay at Cliff's house for free. I was in my TV room watching the war about to happen, and it seemed to me that Tony Blair was really suffering with the decision he'd made and seemed to get really drawn and gaunt and aged, actually, in a very short period of time. So I phoned Cherie, who had met just once or twice, and said, look, I won't be there, but it's free in August. If you want to go, please feel free. And Tony has said to me, they, they've been here three or four times. He said, it's the best holiday he has. My bedroom upstairs has curtains on the balcony. He said he puts the fan on, draws the curtain, and feels totally private, sits on the terrace and reads. Newspapers at the time estimated the cost of renting an equivalent villa on the island at £10,000 a week. The press were all about freeloading, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to charge rent for my, to my friends. So I said, no, use it, and then they signed a cheque to a charity. And uh, so I was happy with that. I was happy and that I could... Do you feel uncomfortable about Tony Blair sleeping in your bed? Something no, not worried. really. <laughs> <laughs> sure, not you at you? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But I still, at this age, 50, I still... <laughs> At this age... <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you look 50. This is the problem I've got with you. Nothing to do with anything else. I've actually always been a bit of a Cliff fan. My problem with you is I'm 43, and you are unbelievably 69 years old. And I right be, now, the viewers are going, who's 69? <laughs> Who's 43? Aren't you? I can tell. And I'm feeling that too. And even more sickeningly, it all seems, to me, quite natural. Well, I mean, it's as natural as it can be. We've got TV makeup on, of course. Yeah, know. but I mean, there's no. This is real skin, right? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Real it is. nose. Oh yeah, no. I, I, I'm waiting to do the, you know, the surgery might come a little later. But I mean, I've I've tried bo Botox, mm. and uh, it didn't work for me actually. And I've got friends who say you should try it again. It, it's it's. I said no. I've done it four or five times, and it made my eyebrows drop. Before the Beatles, David Cassidy, George Michael and Robbie Williams, it was Cliff Richard who became the original British pop pin-up. The British public were ready for a young man to come in, take it by the scruff of the neck. Here's a thousand chicks. He was the hippest, the hottest. He was like, you know, a Justin Timberlake. You just thought that he was the most beautiful thing that had ever been created. All do understand. He is a sex symbol, even today. A snarl of the lip, a rock of the hip, a girl's fainted. Cliff's looks have always been part of this story. Do you think you're vain? Yeah, vain only because... You have to be. You have to. How am I supposed to walk out? Particularly as I get older, I'm thinking, oh, I can't, I can't live up to what everyone expects. And I look at them and go, think, terrible. But you know, vanity is a necessity. You want to look right. And also, I don't see how we can afford to go shopping in our gardening clothes anymore. You know, Britney Spears and others like her, who are good looking people, somehow the paparazzi will get a picture of her wearing absolutely the wrong clothes, shapeless, dirty. I like to be in Armani, I like to be in Terry Moogler stuff. Mm -hmm. If that's vanity, then I'm vain. But I've always thought of vanity as being how fabulous I am. <laughs> and I haven't thought that for years. Only when I look back at old pictures of myself that I realise I had something going for me, even just physically. I could realise why I did get started. 
What I can't understand is how I survived beyond everybody else. I'm really starting to get a feel for how Pop's Mr. Clean likes to live his life. But after the break, he reveals his regrets over his career. Although I won many battles, I have lost the war. And I uncover a darker side to his nature. You go in flailing. It's like, you know, like tiny little Jack Russell. We have now established that you are a, a violent drunk, which is two things <laughs> I, I hadn't really expected. I mean, we're only halfway through, Cliff. Where the hell is this all going to end? Just yesterday morning. If you ask people who Cliff Richard is, the first thing they say is a pop star. The second thing they say is a Christian. In fact, in a poll, Cliff came out top as the most famous Christian of all. Apparently, I was a better known Christian than Mother Teresa. And Jesus. And I beat Jesus mm. once, but then Jesus hadn't had a record for a while. <laughs> but to be actually voted so, a more famous Christian than Jesus Christ is a little weird, Cliff. It's not just weird, it's impossible to deal with. <laughs> it's impossible to deal with. So all those kind of things, I found a great stress factor in my life. It was in the 60s that Cliff Richard found his faith. And unlike many in his position, he chose to go public with it. Cliff, he's not one to follow suit in any way whatsoever. No. So he just took that risk. And he did actually say that. Yeah. He, that's the chance he'd have to take mm. with his fans, because if they can't accept him, this is me, yeah. then, you know, what's it all about? Say to me that Jesus, Jesus and rock and roll, rock and roll can never go together. Let's face it, rock and roll and religion rarely sit well together, and Cliff acquired a holier-than-thou party pooper reputation, which has never really left him. There is this weird caricature of you, no. which I suspect is something you may play up to because well, it's, it's, a good, it's a good brand to have. That's not something that I created for myself. When people try to understand what you are as a Christian, they make the mistake of thinking, oh, they're a bunch of goody-two-shoes. But do you ever sit here, read the stuff and think, right, I'm in Barbados, Sun shining. I've had enough of this. I'm going to head down to Harbour Lights nightclub. I want to get an absolute skinful of booze down my neck, get a few spliffs inside me, and go pull a few birds. Do you ever have that thought process? No. See, I would if I was you. But that's where you're going wrong. I know. <laughs> <laughs> look, so what is it? Is it self-control, or is it just you there, know there you're time... more mature than me? Look, I I can't say that I haven't been drunk because I have been drunk. You I were mean, drunk. Well, you know, you can get that way so easily when you're having fun. I've got friends here. They'll invite 15, 20 people over for lunch, come 4, 30, 5 o'clock. He says, OK, let's get on the beach. He'll call his uh, butler over and say, OK, I'll get a rum punch for Sir Cliff, and I'm going to have a... And we go into the sea with these rum punches, and before you know it, you've had three. Well... Outrageous. I don't remember going to bed that night. But how, I... Cliff, Cliff, how often are you doing this? Not often. I mean, I'm, I'm quite Some people, people say not often enough. <laughs> I didn't feel that good the next day. You see, I find all this quite reassuring. I now feel reassured by this. <laughs> if you'd stood here and said, you know, I'm, I live in Barbados four months a year, whatever, and I never have more than just a single run punch, I'd say, oh, what a waste, Cliff. <laughs> you know, you're 69 years old, you've got all this money, you've got all these homes, it's, it's all not, these friends, just get bladdered a few not, times. There's nothing wrong with having two run punches. It's the third, and I, I promise you this now. <laughs> it, with run punch, it's one of these ones that does get it's you. It's a killer. It's a killer. Actually, it only takes two rum punches for Cliff to lose his memory totally. Um, and that's a lot to be said for Barbados. I mean, I could never have two rum punches. I've, I've had one. They are, but they're like drinking lemonade, you see, you don't know. How many shocking things about Cliff Richard do you know that we don't? Things that would, if they came out on a front page of a newspaper, we'd all be blimey. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what would shock anybody anymore. I don't mean, I, I'm not a shocking person, really. It'd only be shocking because it's you. Yeah, but that's true, but I've often thought I could make the, probably the most fantastic video for a record, and I won't go down that road. <laughs> I refuse, because it's almost too easy. I still want to make a good song, have a good video, and Come put on, it I in. want to have an idea of where you're going with this. What, what, would be, what would the video be like? Look, I'd only have to strip off part way. 
Which part? And even now, when I think of what well, I, I just did... clarified. Top or bottom? Uh, <laughs> if it was the bottom, I would turn around. <laughs> But the thing is, I did a, on my show this last year... I don't think the nation could recover from your bare backside on a video. I don't know, I think they'd never forget. <laughs> See, it's in the back of your mind, isn't it? There's a little devil, isn't there? A little no. devil in the back of your head that occasionally thinks the most outrageous things. There's Just a little, the sheer laugh it There's would a little create. devil, but what I've tried to do is show the positive, positive side of my life rather than anything that might be termed as negative. So I would rather say that when someone annoyed me, Pierce Morgan really annoyed me, rather than hit him, <laughs> I just sat on my hands and smiled my way through <laughs> it. So, to me, that's a success story. That's a success, and I'll share it. So you don't have to punch someone just because you didn't like what they said about you or whatever. Have you, know? you, have you ever punched anybody? No, I haven't. Well, I know, I did when I was a kid. I mean, I, when I first came to England, I used to get bullied a lot. Mm. I guess I was... I'm swarthy now, funnily enough, with a tan from Barbados, but as I had a natural swar swarthiness when I came from India to England, and people used to call me Indie Bum and all that, and... and Race, they were racist. And, well, the kids didn't think of it as racism, but you all did, I know is I spent him? a lot of time to fight. Yeah, one time I got this guy on the ground, and I rubbed his flesh to the bone on, really? the, on the tarmac, because I was so angry. And then I learned, because I wasn't huge, I wasn't big, you would go, you go in flailing. It's like, you know, like tiny little Jack Russells can really... You're scaring me now. <laughs> little Jack Russells can really worry an they, Alsatian they, oh, they because can. they go in really fast and grab a vital point and shake it. Now, fortunately, I don't have to do that anymore. I mean, I, I find... We have now established that you are a, a violent drunk, which is two things <laughs> I, I hadn't really expected. <laughs> I mean, that, we're only halfway through, Cliff. Where the hell is this all going to end? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping it's going to end here. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully for all of us, Cliff gave up his early life of schoolyard scrapping and became this country's most enduring pop star. His longevity as a recording artist is unique. He's managed to change his sound and his look just enough to compete in an ever-changing pop market. It's made him the only artist in the world to top the UK charts in five consecutive decades. He always went for the best songs, what he considered to be the best songs. He wanted the best producers, which he's had over the years. And this, I think, taken in contact with all his enthusiasm for the, for the business, this is what's got him where he is. And with an unbelievable 67 top 10 hits to choose from, there's a crowd pleaser for everybody. Take a look at her hair. I remember you were sitting in the back of the car, you know, when I was a teenager, listening to Living Doll and just thinking, this is the greatest. <laughs> it was a catchy little tune, and you knew it was going to be a number one. After the first week, you knew it was going to hit there and hit there big. I've had many times I can tell you I like his Miss You Nights and the ballads that he sings. He has such a, um, a warmth in his voice. Miss you he always touches me when he sings the bells. I mean, I like silly ones, like On the Beach. <laughs> I can think of nothing better than dancing on the beach. I just really like <laughs> that one. <laughs> That's not one of my favourites. <laughs> I just really <laughs> love that one. It's just such a bubbly song. On the beach. I absolutely love We Don't Talk Anymore. He was working with Alan Turney then, and he made some amazing records. Harry, Ward for Sound, We Don't Talk Anymore. They're brilliant, brilliant pop records. The songs, the songs immediately, you can't deny it, they're brilliantly written. And he's just an incredible performer. It's so funny. Give me your best song you've ever sung, your, of your hits. Oh, I need five or six songs. You're allowed one. You can sing one before Devil you die. Woman. If a Martian was to drop right down here at this moment in time and was to say, what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? I'd say, play devil woman. And I said, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but with the release of Cliff's last number one hit, Millennium Prayer, in 1999, an anti-Cliff backlash began. 
DJs like Chris Evans refuse to play the record on radio, and to this day, airwaves across the nation remain a mostly Cliff Richard free zone. Even now, it remains a big issue for him. Because I'm a recording artist, there is only one way to sell your music in a big way, and that is you've got to have it played six or seven times a day by all the stations in the country. Radio stations are a law unto themselves, and, and there's no way we can change that law. I cannot go around to people saying, you will play my new record. I mean, if I could, I would. <laughs> now, they narrow cast, so they aim you at see, the 10-year-old. Cliff, Cliff, if I was you, and I was living here four months of the year, in this house, looking out there, mm -hmm. I wouldn't give a stuff what they all think of me or what they do to me. What? I wouldn't care that Radio 1 doesn't play me because your fans don't care. The whole no. reason you're still surviving at the top is because actually none of that matters anymore. But do you ever stop being a recording artist? And the answer is definitely no. You know, I got so angry about it once and then my friends were saying, stop whining about airplay. And I said, I'm not whining. I am fighting for what is the major part of my career. And although I won many battles, I have lost the war. Mm. I cannot make them change their minds. They're not going to play your records. If they, don't, if they say, oh, Clifford, oh, no, no, we don't play his music. Um, and maybe Radio 2 is guilty of that too, but at least they do play a full gamut of music. So I'm happy that I'll be sitting listening to them and suddenly I'll hear my record on Radio 2 and I'm going, yes! After the break, I take Cliff back to the house he grew up in to find out just how much his family life shaped the man he is today. Tell me about the day your father died. I mean, what memories do you have of that? Well, I must have been a slightly peed off because he died on us, you know, and, and everything was just beginning to happen for me, really just beginning to happen. As a single man, Cliff seems to enjoy doing exactly as he pleases. But now that I'm getting to grips with what the off-duty Cliff is really like, I'm suspicious that some of the stories I've heard about his little eccentricities might actually be true. You are a bit OCD, aren't you? What's OCD? Obsessive compulsive disorder. Because <laughs> there was one anecdote where you talked about how <laughs> when your guests come, if they've put the loo roll paper back on the wrong way, you go absolutely bonkers. It doesn't make sense to have the loo paper so that it hangs down the wall. It's got to hang on the side that you're going to get hold of it. So, uh, it's like Cliff, even as you're doing that, you know that doesn't look right, aren't <laughs> <only. laughs> you? But some people come and change the toilet, and it's always, I go back and I turn it around. Was it Cherie? No. <laughs> Cherie. <laughs> what is he trying to do to you? <laughs> but are you a bit like that? Are you, are you a, as perfectionist in your private life as you are in professional the thing life? Is, the thing is, I'm a single man. And when you're single and you've been single for a long time, there are things that you've done forever. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to relinquish that. Had I been married, and most married people must go through this all the time, mm -hmm. you have to love the person for the good things more than you dislike them for the bad things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, how's it gonna work? Toilet rolls, just a toilet roll alone if I was married and my wife was constantly turning out the wrong way. Divorce immediately. See, when you used to say, I'm never gonna get married, a lot of people in the old days, sort of 30 years ago, British people go about something a bit weird about it. Now, there's loads of blokes watching this, listening to you thinking, well, he's got a point, isn't he? <laughs> Your love means more to me. Cliff's eternally single status is a subject that fascinates the public. After all, he's a good looking lad and over the years has not exactly been short of options. I love you. A lot of women have worked very closely with Cliff. He's worked with some beautiful women. Eunice Stubbs, Scylla Black, Olivia Newton-John. And they all fall in love with him, but I have the same problem. We all wanted to marry Cliff Richard. We all did. I still do. It wouldn't be hard to fall in love with Cliff Richard, I don't think. He's handsome, he's kind, he's sweet, he's charming. Not me personally, you understand, but... It's a pretty good package, I think. <laughs> when you know really as far as Brits of my generation are concerned, Cliff and Olivia Newton-John were a match made in heaven. Especially Olivia. I mean, they've always been very, very close friends. Cliff and I had a great energy. We clicked right away. And even on stage, when we would do our duets together, we would just kind of do the same thing at the same time. It was, we had a very good connection. Yeah, I always thought they'd get married, actually, but, you know. <laughs> They're obviously just very, very good friends. 
when I was in my late teens and early 20s, marriage was the thing to be part of, and I was part of that world. I didn't. I, I had a couple of close calls, mm. but I didn't actually take the step. Now when I look back, I think to myself, now, do you know, I like where I am. I like what I am, I like who I am, I like where I am. The interesting thing for me, you see, I work with Simon Cowell a lot, for example, who's made it absolutely clear he's never going to get married and never wants kids. Nobody says to him, oh, that means he's gay or this, that and the other. No, but then he's... But you've had to put up with all this stuff for years. Yeah, but everybody, yeah, you have to. Speculation is part of our business. Mm. But, and, and that, I've got past that now. I think most old people could think whatever they like. But I'm always a bit worried about saying never say never. Because you, something could happen for Simon. And the next thing you know, he's... Could it happen for you? I mean, do you ever sit there at the end? looking out on the sea and occasionally think, you know what, I'm nearly 70. It actually would be quite nice to get married. Um, no, I've never done that, funny, because most of the time I don't sit there on my own. Mm. Uh, I always have guests coming through. And sometimes when you've had guests in, in pieces all the way through, the odd days that you give yourself are just wonderfully peaceful. And I have no feelings of loneliness at all. In the early 80s, Cliff discovered the true love of his life. Helped along by the Wimbledon hotshot of the day, Sue Barker, Cliff fell head over heels. With tennis. Cliff, I know you like your tennis. Oh, I do, I love tennis. How good are you? I have my moments when I'm good. This is what worries me, because I can put up with many things, but losing to a 69-year-old man at tennis. <laughs> I haven't got a millennium prayer. <laughs> Watch it. Watch it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so you fancy yourself, do you? Well, I mean, I, I enjoy the game so much, but I mean, I realised, because I only started when I was 40 years old, there was no way I was going to ever get great at this. Well, two celebrities have challenged me at tennis before. Who were they? Chris Evans. Oh, and Diddy, to the left. And Diddy David Hamilton. Oh, really? And they, they both, both, they both I... went down. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> May the best man win, as long as it's me. <laughs> Any oxygen out the back? Oh. Nope. Oh. It would have been very good had it been in. Thank you. Oh. 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 Absolutely typical Cliff Richard. Up 15. He's yeah, been sorry. jammy his whole life. I'm really sorry about that. Never mind all that. <laughs> Up 15. Love 30. Pretty much a bit of pressure here. Love 30. When are you 70? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that's serve. the serve. I really expected that to go up. Fantastic. 15.30. No. Ready, all. Ready, all. That was the wind. Oh, blind. 30, 40. You get the energy. 30, 40. Five years older than my dad. You're playing me off the court. Here comes the rain. Ah! But not soon enough for your sake. <laughs> Thank you. We're supposed to jump the net, but I don't dare. <laughs> well played, Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. You gave a young pup a lesson. Just tell Chris Evans what happened. I mean, look, he hasn't even broken sweat. I'm absolutely exhausted. I think the word you're looking for is knackered. You are a physical freak. <laughs> but on a good positive note, we have got some of your wine from yeah. Portugal. Well, I wanted you to try this because last year in Portugal it was, it was voted by a journalist there the best rosé in Portugal. And, and you know, they make thousands of types, types of rosé, so I was very thrilled. And I remember Gordon Ramsay being rather cynical about your wine. Oh, but what does he know about wine? So why don't we just see what a real expert makes mm -hmm. of it? You know what? It's absolutely delicious. Could you, could you write to Gordon for me? Well, let's just <laughs> send him a message. Gordon, you know absolutely nothing about <laughs> wine, all right? Leave Cliff alone. <laughs> Cliff, delicious. Cheers, mate. Gordon Ramsay, up yours. Oh. <laughs> Too late. That's the third sin. <laughs> A drunken, violent, foul-mouthed Cliff Richard, ladies and gentlemen.
who's very good at tennis. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually very nice. It is nice. I reckon I've got to know a lot more about how Cliff Richard lives when he's out of the spotlight. Most of it's been quite a surprise. But there are areas of his life I've barely touched on. I still want to know more about his family and how his upbringing may have left its mark on him. What's the soon-to-be 70 pop star planning next? And finally, although we've talked about marriage, what does Cliff really think about sex? So, it's farewell sunny Caribbean and hello drizzly England, where I'm going to take him back to where it all began in a vehicle that may stir a few old memories for him. I've asked Cliff to meet me near the town of Chessent in Hertfordshire, which is where he was brought up and where he first became a teenage star. I'm hoping that bringing him here will trigger a more reflective side to his personality and help me engage with him on a more intimate and personal level. I'm not sure why Piers has asked to meet me here. I'm suspicious because he's late. The cliff. But worth waiting for. <laughs> you ready for a summer holiday? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's not the original, is it? It's a root master. It is a root master. Unbelievable. Well, you wanna dance cliff had a string of hit movies in the 60s, of which the most famous was Summer Holiday. Hey, what's up, John? Well, look at that thing ahead of us. What is it? I don't know, but it shouldn't be on the road. What in it, it, he starred as the world's most unlikely bus driver. Why does he stop hooting his horn? There's plenty of room to pass. Oh. Right, Cliff, I've got a little surprise for you. Oh, well, you've already had the surprise. No, this is a big surprise. Oh, okay. I think you're going to like this. Come with me. OK. <laughs> what Cliff doesn't know is that I'm going to take him back inside the council house he shared with his mum, dad and three sisters almost 50 years ago. If we made a left here, it would be my old school, I think. Really? And there's a huge tree coming here. Watch your head. Whoa! <laughs> that nice. wasn't there before. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here we are. The famous Berry Green Estate. <laughs> I mean, when you used to walk along these streets, as a young teenager, I mean, did you ever imagine in a million years that you'd end up the way you have? No, there's no way. You know, we should roller skate down here. But Cliff, this is it. This is number 12. Yep. This is your old home. It is. It looks slightly different. I don't think those kind of porch covers, the storm porches, I don't think that was there. When you look around here, it does seem extraordinary. We've come from Barbados where you have this amazing luxurious home there yes. and now we're back to really the roots this is where it all started i think my house in barbados is is all of these put together yeah. really. <laughs> i have so many great memories of this place absolutely fantastic i was never unhappy here really no i'm now going to take you in because you've not been in this house no in over 50 years so it's going to be quite a moment i <laughs> okay. think oh my goodness look at this i mean nothing looks too different except i had <laughs> there were railings on the, on the steps. <laughs> it's a fantastic feeling, actually, because the mirror that was on the wall there was one of those painted mirrors. It had like an oil painting of a garden scene with a little lady with a, with a parasol. I can remember standing like this, going, uh -huh, <laughs> and trying to get the look in the mirror, and that was where it was. See, I used to do that in my mirror, but it didn't quite work for me. <laughs> At 17, Cliff took his mirror practicing to Soho's Two Eyes Coffee Bar, where the Amy Winehouses and Will Youngs of the day fought to outcool each other on a nightly basis. It was a, like a, a wannabe place. Everybody wanted to be a rock and roll star, went to the Two Eyes Coffee Bar. Cliff met the shadows there, and before long, they found themselves in his house back in Chessent. I mean, this is quite an historic room because this is where the shadows were auditioned, wasn't it? Yeah, um, Hank and Bruce came down and we, we played in this area here and I sang and it was obvious that they were going to be right for me because Hank was so brilliant. He looked like Buddy Holly, played guitar like James Burton. And we knocked through, you know, that'll be the day, a whole lot of shaking going on, a couple of Everly songs. And Cliff said, yeah, great, that's it, you know. The whole of the downstairs was taken up by yeah. these great big mm. tall boys and, and all their musical instruments. Yeah. But it was great, we loved that. Mm. Mm, Actually, it was it probably was fortunate fun. that Dad liked music because he obviously must have helped yeah. Cliff when he was younger. Yes. Because he enjoyed it himself, so mm. he would have pushed it, it along. a great interest, yeah. 
Cliff's father, Roger Webb, had encouraged his son from an early age to follow a music career. But in 1962, at the age of 55, just as Cliff was becoming a major success, he died, leaving the 22-year-old star very much the new head of the family. Tell me about the day your father died. I mean, what memories do you have of that? I was sort of... I don't know what it was. There was a strange thing about it because I... Why would I be angry? And I, now I look back and think, well, I must have been a slightly peed off because he died on us, you know, and, and everything was just beginning to happen for me, really just beginning to happen. What surprised me was how horrified I was by the fact that he died. Did you come to terms with it quickly or did this hang over you for a long time? It hung over me for a while because, and in a way, it played a part in my, my Christian conversion because it led me to query the Bible again. And that led to a conversion for me. So my father's death even played a part in what, to me, has been the, the, the biggest thing that mm. happened. Suddenly finding a spirituality gave my whole life reason, really. And even to this day, uh, my, my faith is intact. It's changed. You know, I've, I'm, I'm no longer a judgmental uh, as I was. I certainly can't, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't judge people. I just accept them as they are and say, look, we have different feelings, different thoughts. Good luck to you. Let's go upstairs. I'm dying to see what you make of it up there. All right. We didn't have the luxury of steel, <laughs> steel ones up here. <laughs> ah, so this was the room you shared originally with all yes. your sisters? Yes. So all four of you in here? Yeah. And this is the window that froze up. I could never understand as a kid how it could freeze up on the inside. So you were freezing cold, you had yeah. no money, you had yeah. to share a room with three girls. Absolutely. And yet, you said you'd never been happier. No, it was fantastic. And then this is the master children's bedroom that you got promoted to. When I finally deserved it, I got a room to myself. I mean, that's not a room, it's a box. Well, it's a, it, they call it a box room, yeah. It's a glorified it's a cupboard. Tiny, yeah, it's, and the funny thing, of course, the, the slope that, that gives you the headspace for the staircase is part of that, there's a cupboard around the corner. And in fact, I, I slept in the cupboard. Let's have a look. Here, there is a cupboard. This is, yeah. this is your cupboard? This is my cupboard. Open it up. Does, I don't know. Can we have to open it up? No one minds. Oh, no, see, there's shelves now, but... You yes, you can still there? see this. See the slope? You can see the bottom there. Yes. There's a slope going up. I pulled my mattress into that, and therefore I... Because I, for some reason, like to, uh, to lie fairly... Hang on, hang on. Hang Rewind. Up. Rewind. Rewind. Sir Cliff Richard, Knight of the Realm, <laughs> Most successful British singing star of all time slept in a cupboard. I slept in a cupboard. Well, my feet were in the room, <laughs> and I used to sleep here, and Bridget Bardot was on that wall. Now, now we're talking. <laughs> what was she doing here? <laughs> After the break, I asked Sir Cliff Richard about sex. How many people out there know the truth about your sex life? I wouldn't. I'd say that I would talk about that to almost... I can't think of anybody I would have spoken to uh, that directly. Really? Even closest friends? My closest friends, you know, wouldn't even ask me about things like that. I'm with Sir Cliff Richard at his childhood home in Hertfordshire. Yep. This is your old home. I've been getting to know the man behind the enigma, but there's one part of his life that remains a mystery. Sir Cliff, what I'm curious about, because I've known you, your career, I interviewed on the Wimbledon News, age 19, you know, so this 25 years ago. Been fascinated by your success over so many decades and everything else, but also struck by the fact that of all the celebrities I've probably ever interviewed, you've always been the most open and honest of all of them. I can't think of anybody more frank about themselves, their, their deficiencies, their virtues, their success, their failures and so on. But the one area that you've allowed over the years, over the decades, to continue to get this sort of mythology around it is your sexuality. And I'm curious why... It's why... not just my sexuality. I mean, there are things that I don't like to talk about publicly because I don't think they're anybody's business. Mm. Um, I've never got that through to the press. And, uh, and they still ask me the questions and I still don't answer them. Mm. Because, I, you know, and I've been asked questions that I wouldn't ask my best friends, people I have known for years. Mm. I would never dream I of ask. I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. And, and, and Do you feel uncomfortable talking about sex? No, not at all, no. I, I'm uncomfortable about talking up with, about sex with people I don't know. So what is the truth about Cliff's story? Has he never met the right woman? 
Is he asexual or is he gay? When he published his autobiography last year, he managed to get tongues wagging again by revealing his close friendship with former priest John McKellen and surprising views on civil partnerships. I saw in your book, it's quite interesting, a quite brave thing for you to say, I thought, as a very renowned Christian, to come out supportive of gay marriage, for example. Well, I'm not sure I'm so, I mean, I'm not sure about the word marriage when it comes to same-sex relationships. What I tried to say in the book was that I gauged everything by my, my parents. If I meet and have met people of the same sex who have been in a relationship for 40, sometimes 50 years, in my book I was trying to say, how can this be so different? Did you get flack from other Christians? for doing that. In, in I haven't the, had. There must be flack out there. The argument against it, I'm not going to labour this point, but the argument against it is that... You know, I the, guess what? Well, uh, some... Against Christianity? No, 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 not against Christianity. Against the gay marriage issue, which has become a big issue for a lot of Christians, isn't it? Yeah, maybe it is. If they don't I, like the idea of a man marrying a man. They don't think it should be allowed. But that's what I mean. I don't use even the word marry. I like that civil union thing. Civil partnership. Civil partnership. Whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, it, it lets you know that these two people are committed, and it can even be written down, and therefore, you know, they can ha they should have the same rights. Did you? I mean, did you regret in your book, for example, detailing your friendship with John, who's the the the, pr the priest who you know shares your life? Because all that did actually was create a huge firestorm again of attention about your alleged sexuality. I've been through it all before. As I say, I like. Did you know that way. was going to happen, or did you, when you read the coverage, think, "Oh, I was." No, I didn't, because uh, it, it doesn't surprise me anymore. But I, I'm disappointed but that they can't just deal with the fact that I will have friends of both sexes. I don't want to be dragged into this open discussion of people that you don't even. And Pierce, look, we don't know each other very well. No. If we became bosom pals, I might tell you all sorts of things, and some of the things you may not like to hear. But, but nevertheless, I won't do that hey, unless... I'm, I'm ready for it. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a very thick skin. Well, I used to edit tabloid well, papers. I've got, heard it all. I haven't got a thick skin. <laughs> I, I find I'm sensitive to a lot of things still. I think my sexuality makes no difference, as it doesn't... Your sexuality, anybody's sexuality, makes no difference to people who you meet and who like you. Who like you? How many people out there know the truth about your sex life? How many people do you trust enough for them to know? I wouldn't I'd say that I would talk about that to almost... I can't think of anybody I would have spoken to uh, that directly. Really? Even closest friends? My closest friends, you know, wouldn't even ask me about things like that. Really? No, of course not, because they're the same ilk of, as I am. They would, they would think it, well, I would think it would be downright uh, rude of them. Because it's, to me, it's totally unnecessary. It, it doesn't make any difference to me. I sing, I make people laugh sometimes. Um, I'm a fairly nice guy. Mm. Uh, I do a lot of charitable work. And in the end, the essence of what I am isn't anything to do with my sexuality. Mm. It's more to do with my childhood, my relationship with my sisters and my family, the relationship with the people that work with me, my friends, and none of that necessarily, it doesn't have to have a se sexual aspect. I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that argument's com got complete logic to it. What I'm hearing loud and clear is that the sex and drugs don't really matter much to Cliff, but the rock and roll definitely does. And for all the glamour and comfort of his luxury life, he's simply not content to step out of the limelight just yet. I know I got call way out, Willie. So, Cliff, here we are. We're in the room where the shadows were auditioned, and you've reunited with them as a huge tour starting. What are your thoughts about this tour? Because this is a great throwback now to. Well, it is. Your I, mean, past. I mean, to think that they play for it is funny, isn't it? But now. Has it, has it been fun to get back with them? Yeah, it, it has been. We got together to do the Royal Variety Show and uh, we didn't stop laughing. And that gave me a good feeling because we always used to laugh a lot. And Bruce is the king of one-liners. Hank is a very funny man. And I thought, this is going to work. Do that crazy head job. It's going to be phenomenal. 50 years will just disappear. It'll be like the early days, you know, big magic. I think it's going to be a fantastic show. I'm really looking forward to it. And even more importantly, you've had a number one in every decade, apart from this one. This one yeah. There is still time, Cliff. 
Well, we have uh, a few months left. Piers, I already have the record. <laughs> I have f number one in five decades. That would be great to have Come the six. You want decade. six, wouldn't you? Of course, I want six. If we could suddenly, and then when I've got that, I'm going to be going. I'm going to want the seventh. But will there be a single out towards the end of this year? Yeah, the Shadows and I have recorded a version of "Singing the Blues," and we've done a really cracking rock and roll version of it. And I think that could be a single. So you never know. I could still do it, you know. But well, you if know, I help you get there, yeah. what's in it for me? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the kudos. You know what? I've settled for I that. I would tell everybody about this. <laughs> Cliff, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I really do mean that. Thank you. Really has. Thank you very much. Well, there's more from Cliff. In fact, much more as we start a Cliff Richard night on ITV3, starting with the 1963 classic Summer Holiday, tomorrow at 4.40. And there's more from Piers Morgan. He starts a new series of life stories, Saturday, the 11th of October. SCS, sit back and enjoy the show. Cliff Richard and the Shadows celebrate their life's work with the brilliant Reunited. Their first album together in more than 30 years. Reunited, featuring the fantastic new single, Singing the Blues. Plus new recordings of their finest hits. Cliff and the Shadows Reunited, a very special album.